All right, so in today's class, I want to start talking about sort of what we call advanced SQL. All right, again, the first homework assignment requires you to do, you know, write SQL queries. Uh, but given that SQL is 40 years old, there's a ton of tutorials in the internet, there's the textbook, and a lot of you actually already have SQL experience. I'd rather not spend today to, to teach you the basics of SQL. I want to teach you the more complicated things you can do with it, the more interesting things. Uh, and and then you know, have you learned to sort of understand the power of what SQL can do. So before I begin that, I just want to make two quick announcements. Uh, if you're interested in database research, which is my, which is my area, uh, there's two additional opportunities you can have this semester to check things out, to learn what's going on in sort of the state-of-the-art database systems. This course is sort of designed as a classic database system course, meaning we'll teach you sort of the basic architecture of how they design stuff in the 70s and 80s. Uh, but if you want to more state-of-the-art things, then the two opportunities are to come to the database research group meetings, which are on Mondays at 4.30 in Gates Hall on the eighth floor. And then we're also having a special seminar series this semester. Uh, we're inviting speakers from time series database companies. The time series databases are systems where you ingest like streams from IoT devices or, or other things, and you want to store them as sort of a, a series of events, and you want to do, do queries on top of them. So we have a bunch of speakers coming throughout the semester from the, the top time series database companies. We're asking the founders and actually the guys that are actually building the database systems to come talk to you about how these systems actually work. So again, both of these are entirely optional. I'll send an announcement on Canvas. Uh, these will also be posted on Panopto and YouTube. Um, so if you want to sit in your dorm room by yourself and watch these, you can do that as well. So real quickly before I get started now talking about the, you know, the relational language in SQL, I just want to say that uh, two things about my lecture style. So the first is that I will not answer any questions at the end of the lecture right, about anything about the materials I covered. So that means that if you have some question, you hold, hold it in until the very end and you run down and try to ask me, I won't answer it because I'd rather you raise your hand and stop me and ask the question during the lecture. Because if you have a question, then probably somebody else does. Right? So I prefer if you did that. The second thing is that I've also been told that I speak fast. I get very excited about databases, and I start speaking very quickly. Uh, so again, if I'm going too fast and you don't understand something, just raise your hand and tell me to shut up and slow down, or re-explain something. Right? Because if I'm speaking too fast for you, then I'm probably speaking too fast for somebody. I'm aware of this problem. I've gone to counseling. Uh, <laughs> And I'm trying to make an effort to not speak fast, but as I said, databases is the only thing I really care about in my life, other than my wife, and so I get excited and I start speaking fast. That's not true, the dog's number three, but that's all right. Um, okay, so in the, in the previous lecture, I posted it yesterday, uh, which I realize is a bit late. Um, so if you haven't watched it yet, there's nothing that we're going to cover here in today's lecture that depends on you, know, you knowing exactly what I talked about in the last class. But I'll just say that what I showed in the second lecture was these sort of mathematical concepts of how you can ask questions on a database system, or on a relational database. So we looked at relational algebra, and we looked at, very briefly, relational calculus. And so obviously you don't write programs in relational calculus or, or relational algebra. You need sort of like a, a programming language that uh, it's easy for humans to write. And so this is essentially what SQL is, right? SQL is the, is the language that you can use in your program to write queries on a relational database system. And the key thing to understand about SQL, and in fact all relational languages in general, is that they are declarative, as opposed to imperative or procedural, as you normally would do in like Python. So what I mean by that in as a declarative programming language is you as the programmer only have to tell the database system what the answer is that you want and not how to compute it. So if you remember from the second lecture when I showed these relational algebra operators, I just, you know, you, we just defined them as sort of low-level primitives to read data and you know, perform filters on, 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 on our relations. We didn't actually specify anything about how we wanted the data system to do that. There was no for loops, there were no uh, you know, uh, built-in hash tables and other things that, that you would normally have in a programming language. We only had to tell the database system what we wanted. And in the relational calculus, the tuple relational calculus was sort of an example of this. We just said exactly what we wanted, we didn't specify any steps, and the database system could, would have to figure out what the best way it is to execute it. So that's the main, uh, the main win you're going to get with SQL as opposed to uh, you know, using Python or C++ to, to program on a database. And so that this means, 
from, from our point of view, from actually the internals of the database system, because that's what we care about in this course, we care about building the, the database system, not just using it, uh, that means it's up for us as the database developers to implement a, a query optimizer inside of our system that can take a SQL query, convert it into the relational operators, and then generate the most efficient plan that we can find how to execute that, that query efficiently. So every time you open up SQLite, or MySQL, or Postgres, or any, any relational database system, and you give it a SQL query, it's going to run through this very complex piece of code called the optimizer that tries to figure out the, the optimal plan for this. And it's actually quite amazing what, what these things can do. Like, you know, it can, they can run these things in, in microseconds or milliseconds. For more complex queries, they take a bit more time. Uh, but this is, we have to do this because the, the user's not telling us exactly what algorithm to use. We have to figure out this, uh, the right strategy on our own. So we'll cover the query optimizer in a few weeks. I'll just say that this is sort of the black art of database systems, right? This is the kind of the piece of the, these systems that, at least in the commercial systems, that they keep very secretive uh, because they've spent, you know, hours and hours and hours, millions of dollars, multiple years building these things. And this is really what separates the commercial database systems, which are very expensive, from the open source guys, right? So the SQL Server database, uh, query optimizer is actually really, really good and much better than MySQL Postgres and SQLite because they've had really smart people with PhDs and a lot of money spending a lot of time to, to improve it. So we'll, we'll cover that later when we talk about query optimization. So the SQL language itself, as I said before, defines, has basically two categories of operations you can do in it. So the first is the DML, the data, data manipulation language. So these are your selects, inserts, updates, deletes. And then you can also have the DDL, or the data definition language. And this is how you define your schema for your database. You create table, create index, create constraints, and things like that. There's some additional things to create views, and there's things you can have to do transactions, and we'll cover those later. Um, but this is, these, this is everything you need to do to program a database can be defined in, in these two categories. So now one very important thing that, that I need to bring up, and it'll come up uh, throughout today's lecture, is that SQL is not based on sets the way relational algebra was. In, instead, it's being based on what are called bags, right? It's an uh, unordered uh, co collection where you're allowed to have duplicates, right? A list has an order and you can have duplicates. A set has no order and you, you can't have duplicates. And a bag is no order with duplicates. And we do this in SQL because it's actually expensive to remove duplicates. There'll be a keyword to actually do this, but in practice, most people don't actually need this. And so it's not worth the extra overhead to figure out, to prune your duplicates when you run your queries. So again, this will come up when we go through a bunch of examples. Just be mindful of and that SQL by default will allow duplicates, and whereas relational algebra does not. All right, so the history of SQL is actually kind of interesting. Um, so again, if you hear me saying, I, I call it SQL, right? But the letters are SQL, all right? Some people say MySQL, some people say uh, MySQL. And the reason why I say SQL is not that I was alive in the 1970s, but when the, the, the language first came out in the 1970s, it was written as S-E-Q-U-E-L, and right? it stood for the Structured English Query Language. So SQL was developed by IBM, at IBM Research when they were building one of the first relational database systems in the 1970s. So again, Ted Codd wrote this, this amazing paper on, on relational model, but he was a mathematician, right? He wasn't a programmer. And uh, these, these people in, in, in San Jose saw the paper and said, hey, let's try to make, this, you know, make one of these database systems. And they basically took his paper and actually made, it, made real software that, that, that was based on the relational model. And so one of the things that they had to develop was the a query language. Because in the relational model paper from Ted Codd, he didn't specify any query language. It was all mathematical notation for relational algebra and relational calculus. He then later proposed a query language called Alpha, which never actually got implemented. Um, but you know, I, these IBM guys that were building System R, they had to sort of invent their own. And they came up with, with SQL. So I, uh, well, System R is going to come up multiple times throughout the lecture, uh, or sorry, the semester, as well as the other early relational database system, Ingress, which came out of uh, 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 Berkeley. Right? If you know Postgres, Ingress is the predecessor. Right? Postgres is post-Ingress. Right? It's the same guy that, that invented both of them. And so, he, so the, the Ingress guys had this other language called Quell that was sort of based on Ted Codd's, uh, Ted Codd's language. And at the time, in the 1970s, the, uh, SQL and Quell were sort of the, they were considered equivalent. They were sort of equal competitors. Um, the other relational database that came out in the later 1970s was Oracle, 
um, which is you know one of the most famous database companies. Um, and they, when they were building Oracle, they actually borrowed a lot of ideas. I don't want to say copied, borrowed a lot of ideas from IBM, because they would literally call the researchers at IBM, and say, hey, you know, what does your thing do if you give it this? What happens with that? And they just re-implemented the same thing in, in Oracle. And so what happened was when IBM never actually really released System R publicly, because um, they still had IMS, they were still making a lot of money with that. But then by the late 1970s, early 1980s, it was sort of obvious that the relational model was going to win. So they released a new database system called DB2, which is still out today in 1983. And it supported SQL, because IBM invented SQL. And since IBM was sort of the computer juggernaut at the time, because they supported SQL, that became the de facto standard. And Oracle was sort of the right place at the right time, and they supported SQL. They were compatible with IBM, and sort of SQL won. Uh, so that's why we, we use SQL today, not Quell or Alpha. So it was ratified as an American standard in 1986, and then became an international standard in 1987. And I think some guy in London owned the copyright or trademark for, for SQL written out as S-E-Q-E-L. -E so they had to shorten it to S-Q-L to avoid a lawsuit. Even though the SQL is 40 years old, it is not a dead language, and there's updates to it all the time. So the latest version of the SQL standard actually came out uh, last year in 2016. And as you can see from the sort of timeline here, every so, years, every so often there's, there's a new update with new features and new functionality. Typically what happens is all the major database vendors get together and they all have sort of some proprietary SQL feature that they added to their system and they push, try to push the standard body to, to adopt it. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, so the latest version, which again, is 2016. This added support for J JSON and polymorphic tables. And as you can see, there's, as you go down, there's sort of all these new features as, uh, that, that gets added to it. So if you're going to build a new relational database system and you want to claim that you, that you support SQL, the bare minimum you need to have is, is what SQL 92 is in that standard. And that's your select, insert, update, delete, basic transactions, uh, your aggregation functions, right? everything like you know, the, the bare bones you need for C to support SQL you, is defined in SQL 92. And so there's a ni nice website here. It's a, it's a few years old now. Uh, but in this, in this website here, the, the guy actually goes through the, the, the major database systems and shows how, where they follow the standard and where they're in incompatible. So this would be come up multiple times, and I'll, I'll show examples of this as we, in this lecture. But although there is a SQL standard, Almost nobody, actually nobody, actually truly follows it. Everyone has their own little proprietary uh, 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 nuances and, and, and di differentiations. Uh, in my opinion, Oracle and Postgres probably the follow the standard the most. MySQL historically was the biggest offender. Uh, they've gotten better in, in recent years, but when everybody, all the other data systems would, would you know, implement a function one way or have it called one thing, MySQL would come up their own, their own term. Uh, but like I said, in the newer versions, they've slowly fixing these things. All right, so for today's agenda, as I said, I want to focus on uh, sort of more advanced features of SQL that you're going to need to you know, understand and know in order to complete the first homework assignment. And again, the, in the textbook, you can read how to do basic selects, inserts, up the updates, deletes. But I want to focus on things that sort of go beyond what they talk about. And in particular, the one that you're going to really need for the homework is, is CTEs, or common table expressions. And I'll give a little demo as we go along to show you how uh, Postgres, SQLite, and MySQL supports these different operations and wh where, where, they, where, they, where they deviate from each other. All right, so for this, the example database I'm going to use in this lecture is a simple university application that has three tables. We have a student, student table with student ID, name, login, and GPA, a course table with a course ID and a name, and then we have a cross-reference table called enrolled that maps the uh, student ID to the course and then lists, lists what their grade is. And again, I'm going to use this as, as the example as, as for every slide. All right, so the first thing we have to talk about are aggregations. So an aggregate is a function that's going to take uh, one or more tuples, a bag of tuples, and then uh, do some kind of computation on them, and then produce a single result. Right, so say, again, say you take the first one, the, the one at the bottom, count. So the count function will count the number of rows that you have and produce a single scalar value that gives you that count. Right? Min and max are sort of obvious. Sum uh, adds together the, all the values of the column, and average takes the average of them. So these, these sort of five functions here, these are defined in the SQL 92 standard. But there's some additional ones, as you can expect, like mode, median, standard deviation uh, in the newer versions and, and, and other database systems. 
So let's look at an example like this. So you put the aggregation function in the output clause of the select statement. And so this example here, we want to count the number of students that have a login that ends with at CS. Right? And then this will just get outputted as a, as, you know, as a scalar value, as its own, own, own tuple. We can also rewrite this in another way. Right? So in the first example I showed, uh, I'm counting the number of logins. Right? But this is actually kind of like unnecessary because we don't actually care what the, what the contents of the login field. We're just counting the tuples that we find. So we can actually replace the actual the field login inside the count and just put a star. Right? That's considered equivalent. Or in another way, we can just put one. Right? For every, every tuple we find, we just count one and add it up. Right? So this is shown as an example that the same <clears throat> SQL query can be written in a bunch of different ways. And this will come up and we talk about more complex things. But this is sort of essentially what the query optimizer is going to try to figure out to do, is how to rewrite your query into a more simple form that's easier to calculate. All right, let's look at another example. We want to get the number of students uh, and their average GPA that have the at CS login. And this shows that you can add, you can have multiple aggregation functions together in your output list, and it'll compute those sort of independently with each other. So this will again, again do our count of all our student IDs, and then takes their GPA and, and, and computes the average. Right? And you get, a, and you get a, a single tuple result like this that has separate values for each of our, 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 um, our aggregation functions. All right, so this is pretty simple. You can do more complex things. You can actually throw the distinct clause in there. So this is going to count the number of students, uh, number of unique students based on their login address. Right? And you can do that again. And this is essentially, again, just finding the duplicate logins, collapsing them to one, and only counting them one time. And again, you get a single scalar like this. All right, so the thing to be mindful of about aggregations is that you're often tempted to get more information about what the aggregate you're computing. Right? So say in this query, we want to get the average GPA of all the students that are enrolled in each course. And so we want to include maybe the course ID, because right? otherwise the average it doesn't make any sense. So this actually won't work, right? because the course ID is undefined for this. So actually, this, most database systems will say you can't actually run this query. Right? Because you think about what you're doing, you're collapsing multiple rows uh, and computing the aggregation on the, on the GPA. And what are you supposed to do with the course ID in each row? Do you take the first one? Do you take a last one? Do you take a random one? MySQL used to give you a random one. And now they fix it and throw an error. Um, and so this is actually also not the, actually not the answer we were looking for either, right? Because we want to take each course and compute their average GPA per course. And so to do this, we can use a, the group by function, the group by operator. So now I'm, this is the exact same query that I had before, but now I'm adding group by at the end on the course ID. And then that will take the um, take all the, the the join tuples from enrolled and student, and then basically take the course ID of the tuples and put them in buckets, right, where they have the same value. And then for each of these buckets, we'll compute the the GPA on them, right. So this again, so this is going to allow us to now to do you know get categories of of aggregations across multiple tuples using the group by clause, right? And so the key thing to point out is that you can't have anything in your select output if it's not included in the group by and it's not part of an aggregation function, right? So here I have, you know, for every reason I'm, I want to do, uh, I want to get the student's name per course. This will actually throw an error because it's going to tell you that it doesn't know how to do anything with this tuple because it's not included in your group by clause. So if you just add it down here, then it could actually compute the, the correct answer. Is this clear? OK. So now you may actually want to filter your aggregations after you've actually produced them. So here, again, we're going to now, now we're going to compute the average GPA on students. And we only want to get the students, or we only want to get the courses where the average GPA is greater than 3.9. So you feel like you want to put the 3. Point, you know, the, 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 in your where clause where average GPA is greater than 3.9. But this won't work because when it's actually when it's actually running this query, as it's doing the filter inside the where clause, it actually hasn't computed the, the, the GPA yet. So it doesn't know how to do this, to run this predicate. So this will throw an error. Um, and so to, to actually, what you really want to do is a having clause. So this basically says, I'm going to compute my aggregation first, 
Then, after I generate my intermediate results, I'll run the, through this having filter, and this will prune out anything that, that shouldn't be there. So you have to use having to, to reference anything you compute in your aggregation after you've computed it. Yes? What if, like, non-aggregated attributes happen to be the same? Your question is, what happens if non-aggregated attributes happen to be the same? What do you mean, what do you mean by that? Could you please go to the previous slide? This one. A previous slide. Yeah. And non-aggregating value that must be up here. I mean, like, if they happen to be the same. What do you mean? So what do you mean by the same? The same name? Yes. Yeah, OK. Like, uh, let's say we aggregate, like, as S dot GPA, but the pain happen to be, like, have a sex, and all, all, all of them are male. Yes. And I just select, like, Average S dot GPA uh, called uh, and like male, as sex. So, so your question is, I think you're, you're asking if I do a group by on on the, say the sex column. Yeah, because like uh, it says it has must appear in group by articles, right? Yes. But sex, uh, I didn't like group by sex, but they happen to be same. I just put in the select. So what do you mean by this? Like they have the same value? Same value. Yeah, but the database system doesn't know that. Right? It, like, you know that because maybe you wrote your application that way. So his question is, can, is there any optimization you can do where even though the values are, the, even though the column is not included in the group by, but they all have the same values, can you then still put it in the where clause? And the answer is no, because remember, we're doing this, like, when the query arrives at the database system before we actually run anything. So we don't, the system doesn't know that it may be the case that that'll, that, we could run the query you want and actually produce the correct answer, right? So it's doing this check beforehand, right? And this is the nice thing about a declarative language is because we can check this before, actually before actually having to run it, right? Okay. So we fix this with having, um, and we get, we get the result we're looking for. And as I said, you basically, the way the system is going to run this is compute the, the, the aggregation first and then do the additional filtering afterwards. All right, so now we can talk about SQL operations. Um, and then, because this comes up in the first homework. So the SQL standard says that all string is, strings in your database or varchar fields, char fields, text fields, uh, any string uh, has to be case sensitive. And the way you define them is using single quotes. And for the most part, most of the database systems actually follow this, right? Uh, the, the black sheep are MySQL and uh, SQLite. So in SQLite, it's case sensitive as, as the way it should be, um, but then they allow you to have single and double quotes. MySQL, at least as of 5.7, the last time I checked, it's case insensitive, and you can have both the single quotes and the double quotes. So I would always try, to, even using MySQL, always try to use single quotes, because it makes your, uh, your, 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 your database code more portable. I have to admit that when I first started using databases on like MySQL 3, I, you know, you always use double quotes, and now when I use other systems, I'm always, to have to go back and correct myself, right? Because it's a force of habit to always put uh, double quotes. And here's just showing that again, in, the, in MySQL, we can run this query and we can have any case of Kanye's name and it'll match. Whereas in the SQL standard, you actually have uh, uppercase everything if you want to do uh, an exact match like that. So we can use, uh, if you want to do pattern matching in, in SQL, we use the like keyword. Um, there are extensions in SQL to uh, support regular expressions, but most of the times this is like the most simple thing you need to use, right? And so you, as you have the like keyword and then you give it a percent sign to mean one or any number of characters can match, right? Think of this as like the dot star and regular expression. And then if you want to match a single character, this would be just an underscore. I don't know why they didn't choose star back then, but it is what it is. So now we can also have a bunch of string functions as well. So the SQL standard defines some basic string operations like string length, uh, substring, and other things like that, um, lower, upper. Um, and of course, all the database systems have their own proprietary uh, string functions and extensions. And um, the key thing I just want to point out, though, is that you can invoke a string function anywhere in the SQL statement you have, you have a string or a varchar. So it can be in your where clause or it can be in the select output. It, it doesn't matter. To concatenate strings, uh, you want to use the double bar. So in the SQL standard, it says this is what you should use. Uh, in SQL Server from Microsoft, they use the plus sign 
And in MySQL, at least as of 5.7, they only support the concat function. I don't know why they don't support uh, the more simple syntax, but if you need to concat strings, this is what you have to use. SQLite will use the double bars. What's that, sorry? Okay. Um, all right, so overall, the strings are usually mostly compatible uh, from across the different database systems. The date and time functions are, are pretty, are pretty loosey-goosey in each system. They're all much, much different. And this sort of sucks, right? Because you think about it, SQL is supposed to be this sort of universal uh, syntax, universal language to communicate or write programs or write code on a, rela a relational database system. But there, you know, there's so many different proprietary things that it makes it very hard to make have your code be portable. Um, so you have WordPress, for example. WordPress only runs on SQL, uh, MySQL. If you want to use another database system, it's a lot of work to actually convert everything. So uh, the date time functions are probably the worst parts, right? And so date times, they have these different operators you can do in different, uh, in, in either the output or the, or the predicates, just like we did with uh, string functions. Um, but things are much, much different. So I want to go a quick demo um, of this. So this is three different database systems running my laptop. Can everyone see that or should I make it, make it bigger? Is that better? So we have uh, Postgres at the top, MySQL in, in, in the middle, and SQLite at the bottom. So all of these w should support uh, the now function, right? And that'll give you the, uh, the current date. Except for SQLite. SQLite doesn't have it, right? <laughs> so instead, uh, they have something called current timestamp. Right? And again, you see that it, it's uh, sort of a, it's an alias for now, because the output said it was going to be now. But then MySQL has current timestamp as well. Right? You can get that. But before I ran now as a function, right? Now I'm running current timestamp with, at, without a function, right? Without the, the parentheses. But I can also run it as a function. Right? I get the output. So let's go back to uh, Postgres and let's try that. Not defined. Right? So you can use the current timestamp as a keyword, but you can't use it as a function in Postgres. Let's see what SQLite has. So who says it will have the keyword? Yes or no? Wait, wait. Raise your hand if you say yes. Raise your hand if you say no. Most people in the back said no. All right. All right, they have, they have the keyword. They have no function. OK. So. Let's do an example now where uh, we try to compute the number of days from today since the beginning of the year, right? And so the, uh, we can use an extract function. I'll use Postgres because Postgres follows, this, I'm sorry, follows this, the standard pretty well. And we can invoke this extract function and, and we, can, we can manipulate our, our, our date fields in, the, uh, in SQL to extract certain things. So this is telling you, take the string 2017-0906, which is today, convert it to a date type, and then we invoke the extract function to extract the day, right, which is the day of the week. And so we can try this in, in MySQL. Oh. See what it does. All right, it gets the same result. We'll try it in SQLite. SQLite doesn't have it. Okay. So in Postgres, getting the number of days since the beginning of the year is actually really easy. Right? We take two dates, right? Today and beginning beginning of the year, and we subtract them and it gives us the number of days. 248. Who says this will work in MySQL? Yes or no? Yes. He says yes. Who says no? Most people, right? The answer is sort of, right? <laughs> it ran, but what? It produces 805. I'm not even sure what that means, right? It's not like two, 248 times 2, right, is not, is not that, right? So it produced some number. So what we can do now, though, is 
we can convert the ah, it's hard to say, sorry. But you can sort of see the query there. So what we'll do is we'll take the current, we'll take convert the string for the dates, convert it to the Unix timestamp, which is the number of seconds since the Unix epoch in 1970. All right, and then we'll round them to be uh, to be integers, and we'll subtract them from each other. But then we'll we'll divide them by 60 seconds times 60 minutes times 24 hours, right? And then it produces 248, uh, and we, we get the answer we're looking for. So this is this is one way to do it. Uh, but MySQL actually has an even easier way. Um, they have what's called a date diff function, right? So this is essentially doing the same thing we did in Postgres where you subtract two things, but they have it to do it as a function. So Postgres actually has a really interesting type system, um, which we'll talk about later in the semester, or later in the course, um, where it allows you to actually define your own types. And then sort of like you can do in like C++, you can then override the operators like plus, minus, multiplication to, to do whatever it is you want to do. So that's sort of why they have a nice, you know, you take a data object and you can subtract from each other and you produce the, the answer you're looking for. And so, of course, none of this is going to work in SQLite. Uh, I took a while of this. I'm not going to show you how to do it. Uh, I figured out how to convert the timestamp into the Julian calendar day, which is the number of days since the beginning of the year, and then you can subtract the two of them, right? And that, we can round that up, but that, that, there you go, That'd be the right answer, 248. So again, a seemingly simple thing to do, count the number of days since the beginning of the year, has to be done completely, in completely different ways in, in SQL for all these different programming languages. OK, so now we can also talk about output redirection. So in all the examples I just showed, when I opened up the terminal, we were running some SQL query, and it would dump out the result to the terminal. But maybe what you really want to do is actually keep the result of a, of a query still in the database system and then run additional queries on top of it. And we want to do this because we, we avoid the problem of maybe running some query, getting the result in our application, which might be running on another machine in, in another data center, and then sending it back up to actually install it as a table. We can define a single query that takes the output and puts it right back into our database. So the SQL standard says you do this by adding the into keyword into your select statement here. Um, and of course, my SQL has to be different. And they, what they do is you can create a table and then inside of the parentheses where you would normally define your columns in your table, you just put a select statement. And then whatever the output of that select statement gets inserted into this table. So with the same column names, the same types, and same everything. But let's say that you already have a table that exists, and so you, you can't use the, the, the select into because that will actually create the table. You can actually use inserts where you put in the parentheses the actual query you want to put into it. Right? And so the key thing about this is that the select statement has to generate results or tuples that have the same number of attributes or columns as the table you're inserting to, and they have to have the same type. Because otherwise it'll, it'll throw an error. There's also other complications you have to deal with when you ha when, if you have constraints on your tables where you don't want to allow duplicates. Right? And the SQL standard I don't think actually specifies what should, what should happen, and all different databases do different things. So let's say I have a primary key uh, where some, there's one field that always has to be unique, and then I run a, a, an insert query like this, where I'm selecting 10 tuples and want to put it into this, this other table. Let's say, though, that there is a duplicate key uh, in the table that I'm select, or from my select that I want to insert into. So should the database system you know, only allow you to insert 9 out of the 10? Should it not let you insert any of them? Should it throw an error? Right? All those different things are left up to the implementation of the, the database vendor. And as far as I know, the different database systems do different things with this. As I said, since, uh, since SQL is based on unordered bag algebra, uh, it's often the case, though, in your application, you need to show things in a sort of results. So we can use the order by clause to, to take any, any SQL result as any query, and then order by the columns that we specify in our output list. We actually do more complicated things, and you get a result like this. You can do more complicated things as well. You can have multiple uh, columns referenced in your, um, in your output clause. You can actually put any arbitrary expression you want in these. Like you can put 1 plus 1 and sort by that. Right? You can put anything in, in these things. And it'll sort based on the first one, followed by the second one. 
And the other key thing to point out here is that unlike in group by, where any column that appeared in your output clause had to appear in your order by clause, you, you can actually uh, not include anything in, you can have something in your order by clause that's not in your output. Right? In group by, you wouldn't be able to do this. So this is telling us to sort the, our query, or sort of the results of this query based on the, on the grade field, but then our output, we don't actually show it. Right? Because this is because we're going to do, we're going to do the sorting first with the column, and then we do a projection to prune out the things that we don't need. Yes? So his question is, how does order one, how does order by one plus one work? So let's try here. Let's do, let's do Postgres. Um, all right. So we have, say, the enroll table. All right. So we can do select star from um, from enrolled. Is that big enough for everyone? See that? Stack star from enrolled where, or actually, we don't even have a where clause. So you order by student ID, right? And as expected, we get our things sorted in the order that we, we, in this column here. So I can do, in theory, one plus one. And it, and it took it. So what's the, what, what, how did this sort it? Undefined. Because what's going to happen is it's, the order by essentially is going to loop through every single uh, tuple in your output. And it will look in whatever the order by clause is and say, well, what's the value of the attribute that you're referencing, or the expression you're referencing, uh, in this first order by clause? And in this case, it's 1 plus 1, the answer is 2. So that means it's sort of think of it as there would be a virtual column for every single tuple that represents the order by expression, and the value is always going to be 2. And therefore, 2 always equals 2, because every tuple is going to have 2, and therefore, it just gives you whatever, whatever order is there. Is this the original table? Is this, yeah, so like, what do you mean by original table? Like, ah, so his question is, and actually, if you look at this, right, so if I do order one plus one, right, I get this order, and I get rid of the order by, it doesn't change, right? It gets the exact same order, right? So his statement is, is this in the same order that it was inserted? And the answer is yes, but no. Yes, because that's what it, what it did, but no, because again, relational, relational database, relational model is unsorted. So just because we inserted things, you know, in one way at one point in time doesn't mean the database system can't come around and insert things in another way later or reshuffle things. And it's still considered correct. If you care about the order, you add the order by clause. All right? So let's try this. Let's try um, order by SID. And I'll, I'll append XYZ to it. Nah, that's like, right? Again, I had, I had my expression, it, it, you know, it took the, the, the student ID, appended XYZ to it, but since it's going to do this for all of them, it ends up being the same. All right? Does that, that answer your question? Okay, cool. All right. Um, you also sometimes want to limit the amount of output you have, and to do this, you, there's a limit clause. And all you have to do is either you put the, the, the number elements you want to uh, produces your output at the end. Yes? In the previous slide, there were two columns in the order by was that to break a tie? <laughs> the question is, there's two columns in the order by clause, and that's what? Yeah. Is that to break a tie? Correct, yeah. So his, question, his statement is, I have two clauses, two uh, columns referenced in my order by clause. What's the purpose of this? Yes, this would actually be used for, to break ties. So the way to think about this, I'll sort everything by grade first, and then produce sort of buckets, and then for each of those buckets, I'll go and then sort them by the student ID. Yes? Yes? Um, so you just said, like, uh, there might be some way for the system to reshuffle every, uh, all the rows in the table. Yes. But should them all have, like, a specific row ID when they upgrade? So, so his statement is, I, the, I made a previous statement that the data system is allowed to reshuffle the order in memory or on disk of how tuples are stored. And then your statement is, aren't tuples going to have a record ID? Yes. And again, this is, for our purpose that we're discussing here, we're not talking actually, actually how these, these things are actually implemented. So the, um, you know, we're dealing with SQL at sort of the logical level, not actually the physical level. So a internal row ID 
which in a, a disk-based database system is usually the block ID and offset. Yes, in some ways, in most database systems, that will be static, and because it's always been the same block right, reference, it's always going to be the same offset. Um, but typically, the row ID would not be exposed to the to you as, 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 the, as the SQL developer, SQL programmer. It's just using that internally for bookkeeping, right? All right in terms of the output, the output is, is what we see in, this, this, in, this, in these results. We don't know anything about how things are actually stored on disk. Another way to think about this is um, in some database systems, let's say I insert a bunch of entries and then I delete an entry, right? Instead of just having a hole on, you know, in my page where I can't use it anymore, the next table that gets inserted would actually reuse that slot. So now when I do my select and I get things in the order, I'm actually going to get that guy that was inserted last sort of in the middle because I reused the slot. Um, we can try with Postgres to force it to do that later. Um, to, you sort of see, you see how that works. But again, you should not be writing your programs in a way where you assume the order of the output. If you care about the order, you have to add the order by clause. All right, so limit, we'll limit the number of entries we have. Uh, we can also use an offset at the end to say to how many elements we, sh we should skip over. So this is going to get the, uh, it's going to skip the first 10 elements and then grab the, the, the next 20. So this is actually how you see a lot of, this is actually how you would implement certain websites where they show you a listing of results and there's like a, a button to click the next page and it shows you the, the next, you know, 10 items. They're essentially running this query like this here. All right, so that's, well, everything I described right there, that's pretty much basic SQL. Uh, and, you know, this, I wanted to sort of focus on the aggregations a little bit because it'll come up when we talk about uh, window functions and CTEs. But so now at this point here, we can actually start talking about more complicated things. So nested queries are a query where you basically have one query embedded inside of another. Um, and the, in, in the internal query, or the, the, the inner query, as, as they're called, can essentially appear anywhere in, in, your, in your select statement here. Right? So here I'm going to select a name from the student where the student ID is in, and then I have my parentheses. And this essentially is going to be a sort of uh, almost like a function that's going to produce a, a result of tuples that I can then use in my predicate to do my evaluation here. So nested queries uh, can be sometimes it's difficult to write, but sometimes it's the only way you can write certain queries. Actually, that's not true. There's other ways, but um, it's often the most natural way for us as humans to write SQL queries. But I will say is that these things are difficult to optimize, as we will cover when we talk about op query optimization. Right? In this example, it's pretty simple because it's just two queries. But you can have sort of you know, nested queries, you know, 10, 10 or 12 uh, queries deep. And these things are really hard for the query optimizer to reason about. Because essentially what the query optimizer wants to do is it, it, it wants to try to you know, generate the most efficient plan. And just because you wrote it in a way that's kind of stupid, it can come up with, possibly come up with a better way, right? So if we took this particular query and um, read it as, sort of as, as, as face value, right? Select an ID where the ID is in and then this, this query here. The, from a human standpoint, you can think of this as like a for loop on the outer query. We're going to go through every single student tuple, and then you're going to rerun this inner query, get all the student IDs, and then check to see whether you have a match. And this is actually what MySQL used to do up until a few years ago, right? And it's obviously the better way, one, you know, one easy way to, to, to do this more, more efficiently is run this query once, store it in like a temporary table, then do a join against it. And that's essentially what a query optimizer is going to try to do, but if you have really deep nesting in your, in your queries, it can actually be pretty difficult. But for our purposes here, we're, again, we're just f focusing this on, uh, uh, you know, what the, the syntax looks like. So let's look at a more complex example. Say we want to run a query. We want to get the names of the students that appear in 15.445. And so we, the way to sort of construct our query, you want to think of sort of at a high level, what's the output we want to generate? And then we can go inside now into our nested queries and figure out what is the information we need to produce that answer. Right? So we know we want to get the names of students. And then our where clause, we want to essentially get what I've written in English here. We want to get the student's ID from the set of people that are enrolled in, in this course. And so we know that there's going to have to be some kind of select query here that has to get the student ID and does the where clause to find the match that, that they're in this course. So the question we would figure out is what do we actually want to put around this to actually make this do what we want to do? And for this, we can use the same in clause that I showed in the last slide. 
where, again, I'm, I'm taking every student on the outer, outer query, taking their student ID and see whether it matches on the internal set there. And again, the database system is going to try to rewrite this to either be a join or a, uh, a temporary query, or sorry, a query with a temporary table. Um, but for our purposes here, we, we can write it like this. And so the key thing to point out here, though, is that there's scoping involved in these nested queries. So in this inner query, we're, we're referencing the student ID, and the outer query, we're referencing student ID. But this, the, the database system knows that the scope of this first one here corresponds to the enroll table, because it's inside of that, our nested query, the inner query. And then the outer query has the student ID reference to the student table here. So we'll show some examples in a second where you actually can reference the outer query's uh, attributes inside of the inner query, but typically you can't go the other way around. So before I show you how to do, you can use in, there's actually three other operators we can use for nested queries. You can have all, which basically says that in our, our expression, all the tuples in our nested query have to, have to, have to uh, satisfy our predicate. Any means at least one of them has to, and then exists says we're not actually checking any predicate, we just have to check to see whether we even got a single tuple in, in our, in our in our inner query. So in essentially just is, is, is an alias for equals any. So I'll show some more examples here. So say we want to get the names of students in uh, 15445. And so this is essentially the same query that I showed before, but instead of putting in, I'm putting equals any. Right? So now this is saying, for, find, me a, a, uh, find every student record where the, the student ID exists in any tuple inside of my inner query there. And I can also rewrite it like this. So now I'm going to put my, my inner query inside of my, the, the select output. Right? It's no longer in the, in the from, it's no longer in the where clause. And this is basically said, does the exact same thing. But now we're sort of flipped the order of the inner query and the outer query. So the outer query is now doing the lookup on the enrolled table. And it's going to find all of the records that, that are of students enrolled in 15445. But then in my select statement, my select output, I'll run an inner query that can then now do a join between the enroll table, find any matches on the student ID, and then produce that as, as the output that I wanted. Again, so this is you know, so flipping around, reversing how we, we thought about the query before, but it's actually going to produce the exact same result. All right, so let's try a more, more complicated example. Say we want to find the student record uh, with the highest uh, student ID that is enrolled in at least one class. So, you think you sort of want to write it like this, right? With the join, where you just want to get the max student ID um, and then just grab their name. Will this work or not work? Who says yes? Who says no? Why no? Uh, doesn't know to associate with Doesn't know to sorry, associate what? Correct, yeah. So again, as I said before, we're computing an aggregate, and we're trying to reference, we don't have a group by clause, we're trying to reference a, 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 another attribute of our tuple, which you know, is undefined because we're collapsing all of the uh, entries, all of our tuples, and producing a single ag aggregate result. Right? So this doesn't work. Um, it will run in SQLite, which we can test. Uh, it used to run in MySQL. I used to give demos in, in early versions of this course with MySQL 5.6, and it would, it, would do the right, it would do the wrong thing. Uh, but now, as of 5.7, they'll throw an error and say, you can't do this. So again, the way we want to sort of tackle this is sort of think about how to construct the, uh, the query by first starting, what, what's the output we need in our outer query, and then figure out what we need to put in our inner query. So we know we want the student ID, and we, we know we want their name from the student table. And so we just need to figure out how to find the student ID that is greater than every other student ID uh, that, that exists in, in, our, in our entire, entire table. Right? So we know we need a, a select statement to go grab all the student IDs from, from the enrolled, right? because we have to look in the enrolled table, because we want to make sure they're actually enrolled in the course. And we know that the student ID from the outer query has to be greater than whatever, whatever student ID we find in the inner query. And so for this, we can just now use the greater than equals to, and then the all, the all, the all operator. So again, what's going to happen here, it's going to take this full predicate here, a student ID greater than equal to all, and, make, and it'll, that'll get satisfied if for every 
student ID defines in the inner query, the predicate is evaluates to true. So if you find one entry with a student that is less than you, then you can stop the inner query right there and, and know that the predicate returns false. And apparently Justin Bieber has the, has the highest ID. All right, and again, as in SQL, we can rewrite this in a bunch of different ways. So here's basically the same result. Right? And we can go back to use the in clause, and, we basically, and now we just say, do grab the max student ID from the entire enroll table. And we don't need a group by here because we're only computing aggregate, uh, you know, single ag aggregate attribute across the entire table. And then if our student ID from the outer query is inside of our result set, which will only contain one tuple of the inner query, then we know we, our, our predicate value to true. So one thing I'll point out is, is the, in this case here, the, this only works so that you can only use the inner query when you only have one output column, one output attribute. If I had comma something else, or like a group by, I had a bunch of different results, then this would actually throw an error because it knows it's trying to take a scalar attribute, student ID, on the outer query and match it to a single attribute on the inner query. So if you have multiple attributes, it doesn't know which one you're actually trying to use, and it'll throw an error. We can rewrite this in a third way, of course, because it's SQL. Um, and this is actually another general optimization you can do if you want to get the max. So rather than um, computing the max aggregate, you can actually sort everything on the student ID and just give it a limit one, and that'll just grab the, the, the first one that you find. Um, these are essentially equivalent. Some database systems will run the max more, more, more efficiently than the order by, and sometimes it's the other way around. All right, one more example that's fine. A course that has no students enrolled in it. And again, the same thing is we start with the outer query. We know we want to get all the course information. And then we want to find in our inner query the enrolled, you know, the courses that don't have any students in, uh, in the enrolled table. And so for this, we can use not exist because this says as long as there does not exist a tuple that satisfies our, or that, that, that is output by our inner query, then we know uh, the outer query tuple uh, matches, uh, it satisfies that predicate. So for this, we can rewrite this as select star from enrolled, where course ID equals, uh, course ID in the course table equals the course ID in the enrolled table. So here's an example of where I'm referencing a attribute from the, from the outer query inside of the inner query, um, but I can't do, do the reverse. So the scope of the outer query includes, is, is, is cast down into the inner query, but you can't go outside of the, in the outer query and reference the inner query. And of course, nobody's enrolled in 15823 because I haven't taught the course in five years. All right. All right, so any questions about nest, uh, nested queries? They're really, really powerful. You can do a lot of interesting things. Uh, historically, people, you know, DBAs or database administrators would tell you to avoid them because they're often difficult for the database system to optimize. Um, but sometimes, it's just again, as, as a human, it's just easier to write queries that way. All right, so now we can talk about window functions. And again, this is another example of a, uh, of a newer feature, eh, it's about 10 years now, a newer feature in SQL uh, that sort of goes beyond what most you know, the textbook talks about. So a window function is a way to form a calculation or an, or an aggregation on a, um, across a bunch of rows without having to actually do a group by, right? So, Think of it as like I can have a bunch of tuples in my output and I can compute some sort of you know, count, uh, a min and max, but for a sort of window of tuples without having to collapse them into a, a single result. Right? And so the, the syntax you would use is you define your, your function first and what fields or attributes you want to compute your function on top of, and then you have this over clause that specifies how you want to group your windows in your, in your tuple results. I'll show some examples that, that, that hopefully make this more, more clear what's going on. I said again, the, so the over, the over keyword will, will define how we're going to slice our data up. We can also do sorting in there as well. All right, so our, our window functions could be any of the aggregates that we talked about before, average, min, max, count, sum. But we also have some two additional operators or two additional functions uh, that are specific to doing uh, window operations. So we can have row number where you can specify what order that the tuple appears in your window, or the, the number of elements in it, and then rank would tell you what the order position is. So again, as I said in the beginning, SQL and the relational model 
they have no notion of order of your tuples, and therefore they should have no notion of, of what rank or position you are in your output. So this is allowing you to impose uh, ordering on your, on your, on your, your data on your, in the query results to produce, you know, to produce the answer you may be looking for. Right, so in this case here, say I want to do a select on the row table, or sorry, in, in the, in the enroll table, and then I want to count, I want to know what position each element appears in my output list. So I use the row number uh, window function, and I define that over, in this case here, I say over nothing, so I'm not going to group anything up, and I'll alias it to the, the row num uh, name, and I get an output like this. And now, so now you see in the, the column all the way on the side, I'm getting one, two, three, four, five. That corresponds to the, the position of the row that is, appears in my output. So again, internally, the database system is not storing a row number for, 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 these, for this table. It's only when you actually compute the query that it does actually add it. So the over keyword is essentially sort of the, the group by part. We can define how, actually how you want to group, group together your windows. Instead of using group by, you use the term partition by. So in this case here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to compute the, I'm going to get for the enroll table, I'm going to get the course ID and the student ID, and I want to know what position the, uh, the, the student is per course, right? So I have three courses, 445, 721, and 826. And in 445 and 721, I have two students, and so they have the row number one and two. And then the last one, they get row number one. Because I'm taking the course ID, again, grouping them into, into buckets or windows, and then I'm having my running total of the row number that I assign to this output column as I go along. Is this clear? Yes. So your question is, because the database is not storing row numbers, can it, sorry, what was the last part? Can the row numbers for a particular row change across invocations based on some optimizations in the uh, uh, so his, his, Yeah, his question is, because the database is computing this row number on the fly, it's actually not storing this in, in the database, can it change if I invoke this query multiple times and the layout of the, the, the physical structure of the database changes, or the table changes? Uh, for, for, this particular, for this particular query, the answer is yes. Um, if I cared, I could add the, uh, an order by clause inside the over part, and that'll sort them in a way that's, that'll be the same every single time I evoke the query. Right, for this particular example, yes. I, I, depending what tuple appears first in the, the data structure, it might choose one or the other. Yes, the good point. Right, so I also say, I have this order by clause here, right? That's not, that's being done after I compute the window function, not, not before. Right? So if I put, say, order by, actually, we can try this. If I put order by student ID, it might actually still, uh, it might actually reverse the order. We can try that. So let's do this in Postgres, because Postgres, you know, I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know if MySQL supports it, but I know Postgres does. Right? So this is the query that I ran. Right, and you have again we have the the, the course number first, and then we and, but then we have the row number one two one two. So his question was, if I or my, my statement that I was making is that if I put the order by on the student ID here, this order by is being being run after you compute the window function, so it's going to be sorting the student IDs afterwards. So even though in my first output here, I have one, two, one, two, one, it's going in the order that they appear in, when I compute the, the, the row number. In my output here, it actually ends up with two, one, two, one, like that, because it sorted them after it computed the, the, the window function. And so if you cared about getting a, um, if you wanted to make sure that you always got the exact same value, uh, no matter how things change, I think you can put order by in here. Right, so now this will be deterministic. No matter how the physical layout of the database changes, you'll always get the exact same result. That's a good point. Okay. All right, 
well, there you go. Spoiler. All right, you can put order by in there along with partition by, and you can do exactly what I just said. So we'll skip this. All right, so let's look at an example here. We want to get the student with the highest grade for each course, right? And now, we're, now you see why you know, SQL can get kind of gnarly here. So we have an inner query where we're going to do our window function and compute the rank, again, getting their position in the course. And we're going to partition by the course ID, but we're going to rank, order them by the grade. So you compute the rank after you do the, the partitioning and then after you do the order by. And then in our outer query, uh, we're going we're gonna to bind this, this inner query as a temporary table called ranking. And then our outer query will reference the, the field, uh, sorry, will reference the field rank that's generated here inside of the inner query. Right, so again, you can daisy chain these things together in the same way we did with relational operators to do additional things on after you compute the inner one. And again, the database, it's up to the database system to decide how, actually how it wants to execute this. It could just execute this inner query once, write it to a temporary table, it's actually probably what it would do, and then it takes that temporary table and then applies the, the, the filter on it. Right, if it was smart, maybe it could do something like, what, well, I know in my outer query I have ranking dot rank equals one, so I won't even bother materializing on the inner query any tuple where rank doesn't equal one. I'll just throw the tuple away because I know I'm, I'm, I'm never going to need it. Uh, how do rank and row number differ? The question is, how does rank and row number differ? So, so, rank, so the rank is the order position of the current row. So if you order, rank is done after you order on the, on the inside. Row numbers are usually what you want, though. OK, so any, qu any questions about window functions? All right, so now, yes, the back. So this question is, if you use rank on the, um, so it's saying row number here. Right, so that gets one, two, one, two, and then I put row numbers, the same thing. I get one, two, one, two. Yeah, let's try that. One, two, one, two. And let's do rank. One, one, one. Let me get back to you about this. I'm forgetting why he's doing this. Alright. What's that? Yeah, yes. Yeah, yes, it's the rank in the ordering. Yes, not when it appears in the partition. Thank you. Yes, that's it. Is that clear? Right, so, so row number says within the window that you define by, in the partition by clause what the position is of, of the tuple. And then the rank says what's your position in the sorting order. OK. All right, yes. Undefined. Yes, undefined. Okay. All right, so the question is, if, 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 you don't if you don't specify the order by clause, what should the order be? And it's, again, it's undefined. The rank will always be one. All right, so uh, to finish up, common table expressions. So these are actually very, very powerful because it allows you to do things you, that people don't think you actually you can do in SQL, right? In SQL, you don't have for loops, you don't have uh, conditionals or uh, control flow uh, clauses, but with common table expressions, you can sort of do, do, do these things. So the way to think about what a CTE is, a common table expression, is that it allows you to define essentially a, a temporary table that is only scoped to the query that, that you're running. So you have this with, with clause and then your, your common table expression, and then this the SQL query here then can reference up into that the common table expression. 
And you can do this as a sort of a global thing, meaning f like for, for the entire, every, every single tuple, or you can do it on a per tuple basis on the bottom query. Like you can sort of think of this like a, as a temporary table without having to define it. All right, so in this example here, my, I'm defining a CTE called CTE name, and then in, in, in the as clause, I have my select statement. In this particular example, it just it selects one. It returns a single tuple with a single attribute, and the value is one. And then down here in my bottom query, I can then reference that table and do whatever it is I, as I would on a normal reg, or a regular table and produce whatever answer that I, that I need to compute. So if you now, uh, if you want to actually make it look more like a table, you can actually give names to these columns from your CTE so that you can reference them uh, in the bottom query. So in, here before, in my CTE, I'm doing select one, two. So this is going to produce a single tuple with two attributes, and the value be one, and the second value would be two. Uh, and by default, I imagine Postgres will just call the first column one, the second column two. But if I want to use a more descriptive name, I can put before my as clause in parentheses the name of the columns, and then down below in my bottom query, I can then reference them, re reference them by that name. Yes? His question is, do I need types for this? No. Right? I mean, again, it's declarative. You can infer what the type is by, you know, because you know what it's trying to do. Right? I can look at my inner, look, look in the inside of the, the CTE, it says select one, therefore it has to be an integer. If I reference, say, a table, then I know what the types are in the table that I'm referencing, so I know the type there. So this is not, it's not, it doesn't bind it at, at runtime, it actually binds it at, at, at the planning time because it knows exactly what you're trying to do. All right, so let's look at an example. So I want to find, it's the same query I had before, where I want to find the student with the highest uh, student ID that has enrolled in at least one course. And before I showed how you could use the, the select maximum enrolled as an inner query, now I'm showing you how to do the exact same thing as, as, as a CTE. So in my CTE, I'm going to get the max student ID, and I'll bind it to an attribute called max ID. And then in the bottom query, I, I can do a join between the student table and the CTE with source table and reference the, the, the max ID that I generated up above. Right? And it produces the same answer. Yes? How is this different from nesting queries? His question is, how is this different from nesting queries? Right. Good. Excellent. Because you can do recursion. So uh, in this example here, uh, I can have my... Nest, I can have my CTE reference itself infinitely. You can't do that with a nested query, right? So in this particular example here, uh, you, have to add the, you have to add this recursive keyword that allow you to reference yourself. So what's going to happen is inside of my query here, I'm going to reference the, 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 the counter field that I defined from CTE source, even though I'm defining what CTE source is. Right, so this, this, will just, in this particular query here, it will produce the sequence of numbers from 1 to 10 because it's going to invoke itself multiple times and add 1 to the counter. The first time you invoke it, you, you select 1 and returns 1, and then you do a union all uh, to just union together all the tuples from, from itself. So this is why this, this, is, why this is different than a, uh, from a nested query. And this allows you to do certain things that are typically difficult to do in SQL. So say you want to do graph traversal, or you have a hierarchical table or a hier hierarchical schema, like a like tree structure, you can use this to, to walk the graph or walk the tree. Right? So it'd be hard to do that uh, in, in, in regular SQL because you'd have to define exactly the number of steps you think you're going to have. Whereas this, now you can have control flow to loop through multiple times uh, and you know, find the data that you're, that you're looking for. Yes? It's like SQL, do you like, like schema checking and type checking to like make sure, like in the previous example, like you compare the ID to a mass value so it worked out, but you ask that like comparing the ID to like a big relation. Is that a failure or happen? So his question, his question is, is SQL type safe? Is it going to check to see whether you're trying to do a comparison between two incompatible types? The answer is yes. Uh, a lot of times they, they'll, they'll try to be nice for you. I mean, we, can, we can give a demo. Like if you have the string one two three and you try to compare it with a, the number one two three, it'll cast it for you. 
Uh, but in some cases, it, it says, I can't do that. Right? It'll throw an error. Um, and again, it can, do, it, can, it can figure this out before you actually run the query. Right? You don't have to do runtime checks. So I'll, I'll give a demo of this CTE in a second, but I'm sure to show the example that he was asking. So he was asking, say I have the string 123, and I want to add uh, the number 1 to it. Who says this will work? Yes or no? Yes? Yes. All right, let's try my SQL. Select 1, 2, 3, plus 1. Who says yes? Who says no? Yes. <laughs> All right. SQLite. No? I did it. But so, so let's take that same example, right? Let's say I put ABC in this now. Who says yes? Who says no? Raise your hand if you say yes. Raise your hand and say no. Right? In, in, invalid. My sequel, yes or no? Oops. Yep. Gives you a warning. You have to go look to see what that was. All right, SQLite. Raise your hand, yes. Raise your hand, no. So the SQL standard says yes. You, sh you should check these things, but it doesn't always do that. OK? Um, all right, so I'm going to show an example of that. Like, so now with CTEs, we have, we have loops. We have recursion. And what's the problem with that? What's that? If you, have, if you, if you can make recursive calls to yourself, what's the problem? Infinite, Infinite loop, right? right. So what I'm doing here is I'm telling uh, Postgres that to set a timeout that if any query runs longer than 10 seconds, kill it, right? Because otherwise it'll, it'll run forever. So here's an example of a recursive query that doesn't, uh, that, that has an infinite loop, right? Because I don't have the clause in there that says if my counter that I'm computing goes above the number 10, kill itself, right? So after 10 seconds, it kills itself. And we know this is actually doing something, right? Because we can, um, this is running on my laptop, and we can, uh, we can run the same query, and we should, we should see Postgres spiking at 100%, right? 100% there, yeah, 100% CPU, right? Because it's just burning through the cycles to try to compute this. And so, if we add now the um, the conditional clause we need to make sure that we stop after we find all the results that we're looking for, um, it'll it'll do that. One, two, three, to ten. All right, so I don't think SQLite supports recursion. My SQL 5.7 does not support CTEs at all. The new version, my SQL 8, that's coming out in a year. I don't know why they skipped 6 or 7, but it's my SQL 8. Uh, that, that will support CTEs. CTEs are very powerful. They're not very common, um, but it allows you to do certain things. The way to think about this, what it's going to allow you to do, and this is sort of my, my concluding remarks, um, is that CTEs are going to allow you to um, be able to write complex queries that only need to run on the database system. So in your homework assignment, you could write some Python code that does a bunch of selects, brings some data down, crunches on it, and then, and then maybe does a run, runs another select and computes another answer. But that's really inefficient because you're going back and forth over the, over the network. I think it's SQLite, it's, it's the same process, but you're going back and forth between your application code and the database system code to compute this answer. But with things like CTEs, nested, nested queries, window functions, it allows you to write within a single SQL statement uh, all, the, all the, 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 the logic you need to compute the answer that you're looking for. And we'll see later on, we're going to talk about user-defined user, user functions but this is a, a, a lot of even more powerful things because now they actually have true for loops and you have true programming language con constructs that you can embed inside of a, uh, your database system and invoke them within a SQL statement. But we'll, we'll, we'll see those later. Yes? Uh, are CDEs and uh, nested queries equivalent at the logical level? 
His question is, are CTEs and nested queries equivalent at the logical le level? No, because CTEs can do conversion, uh, recursion, and nested queries cannot. Nested queries are a special case of CTEs. Like, do query optimizers actually like, uh, do common subquery elimination? His question is, do, uh, do query optimizers actually do uh, specialization or, or with Trans CTEs? Transform subqueries into like CTEs. I, <laughs> that I don't know. Yeah, that, actually, that one I don't know. We should find out. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, uh, like, the feeling is that because nested queries will always run some physical table or whatever you nest, it's not going to be like completely recursive, but the other thing obviously is. Like, I wouldn't go as far as to say it's permanently recursive, but it looks like it's always going to have to share the hands on Nested queries. Yes. Yes. Correct. Yeah. So you, I mean, you can't even write sent. You can't write a nested query that references itself, yeah. right? So, so it's it's not equivalent. Uh, I'm trying to think. If you can do this views. Views. You can't do that either. Yeah. So I, I, I yeah. I think CTEs are a special case because because they're recursive. Yeah, I was just wondering. Okay. All right. Any questions? All right. So, homework one will be due, is due next Wednesday. We're releasing homework, or sorry, project number one on, uh, on Monday. And I'll spend a little time talking about uh, what, you know, the, the layout of the code. So, everything you're going to do for the programming projects will be based on SQLite. But rather than hacking the internals of SQLite, although as beautiful as it is, it is very complex. We are sort of providing you with a nice little shell environment that can use the SQLite front end, but all the, the, the actual internals of your storage manager will be, will be written by you guys. Okay? All right, guys. Uh, thank you for coming, and we'll see you on Monday next week.